back in 1 Corinthians this morning and uh, reminded of uh, my kids. How many of you guys had kids? Quite a few, yeah, yeah. Uh, one of the, one of the, I mean, kids are challenged, right? I mean, they're never, never kids having kids is never easy, right? I mean, it's, it's always stretching. I mean, they don't have to push your buttons, right? I mean, it's just, I was a pretty calm, cool, collected guy until I had kids, right? And I was like, oh my gosh, I am so angry all the time. Anyway, so kids, right? I mean, but uh, one of the fun things about kids is their imagination, Right? I mean, it is amazing what they'll come up with. I mean, I mean, I even remember when I was a kid, you know, the games that we would play. I remember, you know, the battle boat, right? You know, you're sitting on the bed, you have the big fan, you know, one of those big box fans, right? And that's your motor, right? And so you're on the bed, you're going to hit it full speed, and you crank the fan up, and it's blown, and you're talking to each other. You know, this kind of thing through the fan. Anyway, you just imagine it. Our kids are that way too, right? Kids are just, they love to create, you know, with their minds right and it's amazing you know Christmas right it's always the box that is the hit right you know it's like it's not the toy that was in the box it's this really cool box that we can play with right it's like so fun anyway so kids are uh, they have this amazing imagination I remember our our son he uh, loved and and they always have heroes right and so my son had this one uh, you know he was had a he had a a Pokemon Pokemon phase right I mean, how many of we all, I mean, we've all had a Pokemon phase. I mean, come on, admit it, right? But anyway, he had a Pokemon phase when he was younger, and, and so he's really excited about Pokemon. And so I remember one year for Halloween, he, uh, Debbie did an amazing job of creating this costume for him to wear. It was Charizard, I believe, right? Yeah, Charizard costume, right? Which is this weird dragon-like, you know, kind of Pokemon and whatnot. If you know anything about Pokemon, you'll know what I'm talking about. Uh, any, I hardly know what I'm talking about just because, I mean, it's, it's so much. But anyway, so he, it was awesome, right? And he goes around the house for like a week, right, with this Charizard outfit on, right, you know, and, and pretending like he's this Pokemon, right, and has this Pokemon's powers and, and can know all these things, right? And, and, you know, Debbie and I, you know, that's cute, right? And it's really cool, but we also realize, you know, it's like he doesn't really have those powers, right? I mean, so it doesn't matter what he thinks in his head and how much he looks like it. He, he really, you know, it's just, you know, it's just imagination. It's fun. It's his plan, right? And, you know, but that's what we do as kids, right? We, we never grow up as adults and dress up, say, like Simon and Garfunkel and pretend like you can sing and play the guitar, right? I mean, we don't do that, right? Don't wear that wig around the house for the next week and tell your wife that, hey, honey, I'm Garfunkel. You know, no, you don't do that, no. But, no, but we, we do, right? I, I think we, we actually, there's a sense, you know, we, we, like, we have that imagination and we, we like to do that. And, and we actually do that, I think, more regularly than we actually realize. I mean, the, in, in essence, the masks that we wear, the, the persona that we're trying to communicate to those around us, right, of, of who we are, based on maybe how we dress, based on, you know, what we say or how we say it, or based on the information that we communicate verbally and non-verbally to those around us, we are communicating uh, sometimes something that's actually not real, right? I mean, what, we, what, what it looks like isn't always what it really is. I mean, how many of you Oh, had, a, had, had a restaurant and, or even maybe in your backyard and you cook this amazing steak and you pull it out and it's on the plate and you're like, oh my gosh, look at it, it's just beautiful and you smell it and you're like, oh, it smells so awesome, I can't wait to have the steak and then you cut into it and it's like, moo, and you're like, oh, no thank you, right? You know, it looks great, it looks like it's been cooked, but yeah, maybe not, right? You know, so looks can be deceiving and we in the Ameri- our American culture we have this uh, tendency to actually be immature and continue to try to communicate these messages about who we are, but not really who we are, right? This image that we're casting. And and we in the church, we do this as well. And consider some of the the statements that are used. You know, dress for success, right? I mean, this concept is is that, you know, we look good on the outside in essence, right? If, If you look good on the outside, if you look the part on the outside, then you are the part kind of thing, right? It, you know, I can go around and if I, if I look like a pastor, right? If I have skinny jeans, then I can look like a worship pastor, right? I mean, it, you know, if we, if we do the right things, if we look the right way, then people will receive us that way. Uh, in, in the church, we've seen 
the ugliness of this, uh, and this is kind of a tough topic to mention, but I think it, it illustrates the point that, that we are communicating something that's not real. It, the Catholic Church and now the Southern Baptist reports and some of the abuses, the child abuses that have happened in those organizations, outwardly they're looking like they've got it all together, but there's something ugly underneath the surface, right? There's something that hasn't totally transformed them inside. Uh, another uh, bigger and better, bigger is better, right? I mean, this is another concept in, a, in America that, you know, we, we, if it's bigger, well, it, it's got to be better, right? I mean, it, duh, right? Because it's bigger. More people are participating in it. More money is, you know, raised from that or whatever. And so bigger is better. And we in the church, we, we do this as well. We, we like to copy what's big. Right, you know, it's the Saddleback Church, you know, that we want to we want to mimic. Right, we want to be like them, and so we read all the books that their leaders and pastors have re have written. Right, so that we can be like that church because we want to be bigger as a church. Right, and in this kind of concept, also another statement: end of, the end justifies the means. There's another statement that kind of creates this. It's all about the results perspective. Right? It, it, it doesn't matter how we get there, but we need to make sure that on the outside we look good. That on the outside things are happening the way we want them to happen. And, and, uh, have it your way is another one that we use. You know, the idea that we can have a personal preference is the most important thing. No matter what, our tendency, I think, in, in America, and, and just as Christians, I think as human Christians, is to emphasize oftentimes the wrong things. We, we, we are more concerned with what's going on on the outside than what's really happening on the inside. We have a tendency to focus on the physical realities instead of the spiritual realities. And the Corinthian church had this same struggle. The, the same immaturity that they were focusing on physical realities they were focusing on the, the things of the world in order to look like they're successful. That they would have a leader that is theirs that they could try, you know, that they could celebrate and they could follow and they could do everything that they say because they're so good and they're so amazing and we want to be just like them. And so we're going to make ourselves on the outside look like we're successful. Let's take a look. 1 Corinthians chapter 3. Brothers and sisters, I could not address you as people who live by the Spirit, but as people who are still worldly, mere infants in Christ. I gave you milk, not solid food, for you were not ready for it. Indeed, you are still not ready. You are still worldly. For since there is jealousy and quarreling among you, are you not worldly? Are you not acting like mere humans? For when one says, I follow Paul, and another, I follow Apollos, are you not mere humans? What, after all, is Apollos? And what is Paul? Only servants through whom you came to believe as the Lord has assigned to each his task. I planted the seed, Apollos watered it, but God has been making it grow. So neither the one who plants nor the one who waters is anything, but only God who makes things grow. The one who plants and the one who waters have one purpose, and they will each be rewarded according to their own labor. For we are co-workers in God's service. You are God's field, God's building. By the grace God has given me, I laid a foundation as a wise builder, and someone else is building on it. But each one should build with care. For no one can lay any foundation other than the one already laid, which is Jesus Christ. If anyone builds on this foundation using gold, silver, costly stones, wood, hay, or straw, their work will be shown for what it is, because the day will bring it to light. It will be revealed with fire, and the fire will test the quality of each person's work. If what has been built survives, the builder will receive a reward. If it is burned up, the builder will suffer loss, but yet will be saved, even though only as one escaping through the flames." Don't you know that you yourselves are God's temple and that God's Spirit dwells in your midst? If anyone destroys God's temple, God will destroy that person. For God's temple is sacred and you together are that temple. Do not, be deceived. Do not deceive yourself. If any of you think you are wise by the standards of this age, you should become fools so that you may become wise. For the wisdom of this world is foolishness in God's sight. 
as it is written, he catches the wise in their craftiness. And again, the Lord knows that the thoughts of the wise are futile. So then, no more boasting about human leaders. All things are yours, whether Paul or Apollos or Cephas, or the world or life or death or the present or the future. All are yours, and you are of Christ, and Christ is of God. Paul is addressing, addressing the immaturity of the Corinthians and the, imagery, the, 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 the image of success that they're trying to promote and communicate to the world that is not true, that it's not real. And Paul starts, and, and, and before I get into what Paul's talking about, let me be clear on this. The, Paul's word here is not to the individual believers. We often look at this chapter and we can look at it and say, this is for me as an individual Christian. How am I going to live this out, me personally? And certainly this passage has ramifications for us individually. But Paul's purpose in writing this is to the church. It is to corporately who we are as a church. Who are we as a corporation, as a church? Who are we trying to communicate that we are? And is that communication real or not? Is, are we focused as a church on the physical realities and instead of the spiritual realities? So this, all that we're going to, I, I want to focus on the church this morning and not individual. So don't read this from the perspective that this is for you individually, how you need to live this out. But how does this, what does this mean for us as Trinity Alliance Church? So first of all, Paul points out that it's all about God's sovereignty. Right? He, he wants to be clear that, you know what, all of that we're doing here, the reason that we're here as a church, the, everything that we're going to accomplish is a result of God's sovereignty, not anything that we have to offer. God is the one who places churches where they are placed. God was the one who placed Trinity Alliance Church in this piece of land, in Reading, in, in between Reading and Bella Vista, if you will. It is God who placed us here. God is also the one who has gifted His church. He has gifted His church to do His work, but He's gifted Trinity Alliance Church. He has gifted us to sow what God has given us. He's, he's, he's given us the realities of pain and sorrow. So many people in this church have gone through tragedy. The, they may have been individual tra tragedies, but when you put them together corporately, you realize that God has gifted this church to walk with people through sorrow and suffering and struggle. We can do it, and we can do it well. Because God has blessed us in the midst of that. He's, he's allowed us to have that opportunity. We've also had that opportunity corporately. So often churches, will, uh, will, when they start thinking about their ministry and what they want to do in the community, they think about some awesome project or they, uh, uh, they uh, rip it off of some other church in town that's got this great you know, uh, street ministry. And they say, oh, well, I want to do that. We should do that because that, look at all the great things they're doing. And they totally ignore how God has already gifted them. And it's not that we don't take steps of faith as God leads, but that we as a church would go, what is, how has God gifted us? And then how can we put that into ministry in this community? How has God equipped us and already to minister to this community? For instance, we wouldn't be a good location for a latchkey program, right? After school program. I mean, we do have a school down the street. We can maybe help out down there. But here in this piece of property... <laughs> Just consider where we're at, right? There's not a neighborhood around us, right? So we need to think about that because God is the one who's gifted us. God is also the one who directs us to do His work. He's the one that directs us to that ministry. We water what God directs us to water. The people that are in this building are the ones that God has brought to us and is directing us to care for and to love on. They've, the people that we are interacting at the Bella Vista School, staff there, and now some of the students and families. God has led us and opened up the door for us. He's directed us to that school to bless them and to care for them and to love them. We've got people in our church involved in the Union Gospel Mission. That's another area that individuals in our church are participating in, right? And, and, and sharing God's love in. 
So that's another aspect of the Trinity Alliance Church ministry. It's like, where is God leading individuals in the church? That defines what we do as a church, what God is leading us as a church to do. Finally, God also grows us. God places us, God gifts us, God directs us, and God grows us. He's the one that brings growth. Again, God is sovereign, and I want to spend some time on growth because we get so focused on growth, and, and, and we just, I think we miss it. I think we have a misunderstanding so often about what is growth and what does it actually mean. So, planting and growing. I think there's three areas that God grows His church. First of all, He grows us in spiritual maturity. In, in essence, sanctification, right? He's, he's developing, developing us individually and corporately to, have a, 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 to be more sanctified, to be more holy, to be more like Him, and to live that out. This, this is what He's doing. And, it's, and it's, it's, a, it's a dual interaction, right? It's not just God by Himself, but it's God's sovereignty, first of all, and it is our involvement as well, and our involvement is our surrender. God's sovereignty plus our surrender equals spiritual maturity. It is His pace. We get so frustrated with God sometimes because we're like, I, you know, those of us you know, who really are excited about God and we want to grow, we get frustrated with our struggle with sin sometimes, just like Paul did, right? But we need to understand that our growth spiritually is at God's pace. He is sovereign. You know, we, we think that we just, you know what, if I just put more effort into it, then I will find success. And we just totally leave out God. We, it's like, no, it, it, the only reason I'm failing is because I failed, because I haven't put enough time in, I haven't put enough effort. I mean, we have to give effort, don't get me wrong, but it is God's pace. There are some things that we can't learn and fully understand until we get to that spot, right, that time. So we always try to rush our maturity, but it's based on God's pace, not ours. It's also, we tend to focus again on the physical side of things, the physical growth, the outward signs, the talking right, the living right. And so we end up focusing on that so much that, you know, we, we, we get really good at public prayer. We get really good at being involved in public Bible studies. We get really good at, you know, being at all the church events that are going on so that we look like we're more spiritual. We are talking right. We are living right. But is maturity really happened yet is the question. Because if we only focus on the outward signs that we are mature, then that will eventually lead us to pride, to our own fame, and to a hypocrisy that this world already recognizes in the church. Because we as a church have been so focused on just looking good on the outside, we haven't done any work on the inside, and as a result, we're hypocrites. True growth, true spiritual growth, comes from focusing on our relationship with God. True spiritual growth comes through focusing on our relationship with God. Personal times of prayer. It's not about people when people see you praying. Some of us are really good at showing up on Tuesday nights to pray. Some of us are really good at showing up at you know, 8 o'clock in the morning on Sundays to pray so that everybody sees us praying. But how many of us, of those people, are actually praying through the week? I'm sure, sure many of them, maybe all of them. But how many of them are alone with God in the morning, alone with God in the afternoon, alone with God in their closets in the evening, praying? It's personal prayer. It's personal study and understanding who God is. It's obedience. And when we focus on our relationship with God, then the result is that God does bring sanctification in his time at his pace but it's it's sanctification inside and out consider this passage luke chapter 6 verse 45 jesus the good person out of the good treasure of his heart produces good and the evil person out of his evil treasure produces evil for out of the abundance of the heart his mouth speaks Jesus is talking about fruit here. 
and how we can recognize whether someone is good or not. And it's not just about the fruit. It's about the branches. It's about the tree trunk. It's about what is inside. Have you changed inside? If you've changed inside, then your fruit will be good. If you haven't changed inside, your fruit is going to continue to be got bad, even if it, quote unquote, looks good. The next kind of growth that we see in the church and that God brings in the church is growth numerically, growth of our membership or of the members. This kind of growth takes two things. First of all, it takes God's sovereignty. God is in control, not us. It also takes our vulnerability. And no one likes to focus on this. You see, God brings His people to His church in His time. God is sovereign. We so often want to create a physical uh, uh, reality, a physical result by, uh, by focusing on getting people into the church. We, we think, you know what, God wants me to have a, a huge you know, church. God wants this church to grow. I mean, I've heard pastors say this, and it just, it's so sad for me. I mean, part of it is there's some truth in it, but it's also corrupted truth. Because they, they, they sit there, I, you know, I just don't think that God wants his church to ever decline. I don't, want his, I don't think God wants his church ever to be just, you know, stagnant. I think God always is growing his church to become bigger and better. And while maybe worldwide that may be true, but individually as a church, that is up to him. And sometimes I think God does want to, to diminish a church. I mean, look at the Old Testament. What, what happened, right? The remnant is who, who was holy, who was God's people. Over and over again, it was, you know, cut down. Right? What is, it was 12 tribes at one time, and then it was two tribes. And then it was Jesus. And then Jesus started building it from there again, right? So there's this sense that, you know, we need to, we, we, we always tend to focus on how we can attract more people to our church. We think that growth is about us drawing people in by you know, doing something that's going to appease the culture, about doing something that's going to draw, you know, be attractive to our culture or to people out there. People actually do giveaways at some churches. We're going to give away an iPad this morning. All right, come to our church, you know, and put it in the paper, right? And everybody's, everybody's entered to win, right? I mean, what are we, what are we doing? The result of a church that focuses on membership growth is pride, fame, and commodified Christianity. Think about that. Commodified Christianity. But true growth, true growth that God instigates comes when we focus on our relationships with each other, within the family. That we would focus on our fellowship. Focus on being transparent with one another. Of being authentic with each other. You know, if you want to attract people to come to this church, the best thing you can do is be attractive. And how do you be attractive? By spending time and loving people around you. Right? It, it, we need to open up our lives to each other. Allow each other to, to speak into our lives. Accountability, you know, they were talking about that, the, the Kuipers were talking about that in our group. Look, accountability is a dirty word in our culture, even in churches today. That we would be vulnerable with each other. Recognizing, yeah, it might be painful sometimes. And yeah, it might hurt sometimes and somebody might stab us in the back. But this is what we're called to, is relationship with one another. To love one another well. When we do that, then the result is intimate community. And God will add to our number when He decides to, or if He decides to. It is not what we do to attract the culture. It's about us focusing on relationship here and trusting that God will add numbers when He wants to. Read. i got to read. I, says, I wrote this in my notes. Read this passage. So I'm going to read this passage because it is. I have a couple of verses up here, but I know you've heard this before, but we, we, we miss things here. We, we miss understand this. Chapter 4 of Acts, verses 42 to... No, that's not chapter 2 of Acts. Me, 42 
uh, to 47. Great passage talking about the church. They devoted themselves, the church did, to the apostles' teaching and to fellowship and to the breaking of bread and to prayer. Everyone was filled with awe at the many word, wonders and signs performed by the apostles. All the believers were together and had everything in common. They sold property and possessions to give to anyone that had need. Every day they continued to meet together in the temple courts. They broke bread in their homes and ate together with glad and sincere hearts, praising God and enjoying the favor of all the people. And the Lord, not their attraction, not their programs, not their advertisements, and the Lord added to their number daily those who were being saved. It was God's choice to add to the church. God was the one that did it, not the church. It could be argued even in this passage, there's nothing about evangelism in there. It's not talking about they, they had this great evangelistic system and program that they put to play. They were lifestyle evangelists, and so they were out in the... No, none of that. They were a community together, loving each other well, and God added to their number. It's about God's sovereignty, and it's about our vulnerability with each other that brings growth in our church. The next type of growth is movement or influence. Global impact, if you will. This takes two things as well. It takes, again, God's sovereignty. God is in control of how much we are going to be an influence in this world, and it also takes our humility. God's sovereignty and our hum humility equals movement, influence. It's about God's direction and our availability. It's about what God is leading us to, not what we want to do. We again focus on the outward signs. The church has done this for some time now, maybe a hundred years. Focused on the physical growth. We want to have more conversions. And that is a good thing, right? I mean, it's great to have conversions. I mean, everybody talks about growth you know, numerically in a church, but then you always have, you know, the one who is a really good Bible scholar and say, well, what about conversion growth? I mean, yeah, we may just have people in ch different churches that are just bouncing around to different churches, but what about conversion growth? Is there anyone in your church that's a new Christian? Are you bringing anybody to Christ? And so that is now, the, this is the success factor, right? This is how we're going to measure it, is about conversions. And so then we walk down that path a little further, and now what we start to do is we start to lower the bar, because maybe we're struggling, we're realizing, you know what, darn it, people have free will. And I give them, you know, that gospel message. Oh, man, did I present it really well. Man, I used all of the steps I was supposed to be using and I was trained to use. And they still didn't pray the prayer at the end. They still didn't come to Christ. Boy, so what are we going to do? How are we going to build those numbers? We begin to lower the bar. So now it's not really about becoming a Christian. I mean, Christianity isn't about giving up anything. Oh, no, you don't have to really change your life much. You just have to start coming to church on Sundays. It's all right. And that's a conversion. There's no longer repentance in conversion. Even just, and, uh, don't get me wrong, right? The, the, the prayer, the, the sinner's prayer is not in the Bible. But, but we use it as this like line somewhere that says that before you say it, you're not. After you say it, you are. And so... Our evangelistic efforts sometimes are all about the prayer. We just want to get them to pray that prayer. Like those words are some kind of magic potion. Conversion is about the heart. It's not about what we say. And it does cost us something. Jesus is Lord. This is why our churches have too many Christians in it. And I don't know, maybe they're not Christians. I don't know. That, that have prayed the prayer, but they've never bowed their knee. We are not in charge of conversions. And when we focus on physical growth, it results in pride. It re results in our fame. And it results in Christian pluralism. Where we've got people that believe all kinds of things, very little of it is actually in the Bible. Because we've lowered the bar so far, for conversion in order to build our conversion numbers. True growth comes when we focus on building relationships with the world. Our job, the seed that we plant, is relational. 
It is not about getting them to pray the prayer or to give their life to Christ. Matter of fact, too many of our evangelistic efforts are all about the conversion and not about the person. And so we have people that go out and they bring all these people to Christ and then they send them to the church and then they never talk to those conversions again. And so now they're just a number. These new conversions are just numbers in the church. Well, thank you. I'm glad you could check off your list of who you brought to Christ this week. True conversion and true, uh, true growth comes out of us focusing on individuals to actually develop a relationship with a lost person. To really love them in the hard things when they don't believe the way we believe, when they don't live the way that we, we live. To love them to put our arms around them, to be a part of their life and their journey, despite the fact that we have a different perspective of the world. That is, that's our job. That's the planting of the seed. It is God's job to bring them to salvation. His job is the conversion. When we focus simply on building the relationships, the result is that we love our neighbor. Let's go back to Luke. Chapter 10, I have on here, read again, because this is a great passage that needs to be read. All of it, not just the two verses that I have on the board. We know the story, don't we? It's the Good Samaritan. On occasion, an expert in the law stood up to test Jesus. Teacher, he asked, what must I do to inherit eternal life? What is written in the law, he replied. How do you read it? He answered, love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your strength and with all your mind and love your neighbor as yourself. You have answered correctly, Jesus replied. Do this and you will live. But he wanted to justify himself. So he asked Jesus, and who is my neighbor? In reply, Jesus said, a man was going down from Jerusalem to Jericho when he was attacked by robbers. They stripped him of his clothes, beat him, and went away, leaving him half dead. A priest happened to be going down the same road, and when he saw the man, he passed by on the other side. So too a Levite, when he came to the place and saw him, passed by on the other side. But a Samaritan, as he traveled, came where the man was. And when he saw him, he took pity on him. He went to him and bandaged his wounds pouring in oil and wine. Then he put the man on his donkey and brought him to an inn and took care of him. The next day he took out two denarii and gave them to the innkeeper. Look after him, he said, and when I return, I will reimburse you for any extra expense you may have. The Samaritan was not concerned with a conversion. He was not concerned that this man was not holy. He's not concerned that this man was nasty because he'd been beaten and bloody. He wasn't concerned with any of that. He was concerned with caring for this individual who was on the road and just needed someone to love him, but the the pastor walked by and ignored him. The elder or the deacon walked by and ignored him. Because, I mean, I don't know, that guy's kind of dirty over there. I mean, what do I really have to offer this guy? I mean, I don't want to get, I mean, what if he swears? Right? Conversion is God's work. Our work just love them, these people. To love the world. To be their neighbor. To be there for them. To help them out. Tragedies like this, I mean, we come together as a church, you know, when you have snowmageddon, right? I mean, you, you, have, you have this great, you know, we come together as a church to love on each other, but are we also helping our neighbors? Whether, I mean, maybe, maybe they're, you know, homosexual neighbors. Are we, are we going to help them out? Yeah. Lament. This is our job, is to plant the seed. The planting of the seed is loving our neighbor. All right, I got so much more, but you know what? We're going to wait till next week to get that because I can do that. So that's, I'm a pastor. I can do that, right? My prerogative. So worship team, why don't you come forward? We, we, we have a tendency to look on the outside we have a tendency to look on the things that we think are success. And, 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 the, and the reality is, is that all of our understandings of success are based in the physical world. 
The physical world has told us these things are success. And so we think in order to get those things, and get, don't get me wrong, right? Because those things are successful. Living righteously, that's a good thing, right? That's, this is obedience to Christ. We should do that. But when we only focus on the physical and forget about the heart issues and the relational issues, then we miss the whole thing. Then all of a sudden, this physical righteousness is corrupted because internally we are not in that spot. It's just we're kind of going through rote instead of really understanding who God is. May we as a church focus on relationship with God, with each other, and the world. And let God deal with when the spiritual maturity comes, when the numbers come, if they do, as growth-wise, and when the conversions come, if they do. Let him deal with those things. That's, that's God's sovereignty stuff. We just need to be about relationship with him, each other, and with the world. Let's stand and close in some worship. Thank you.